Today we'll talk about food, and here's why. If you ever look at the scriptures, there seems to be food everywhere. Think about the Garden of Eden. What was the test? Not to eat the apple. Yeah, which food you're going to eat, right? Mm -hmm. So you go to the table, and you get tested, and I get tested every time I go to the table because I can't eat too much carbs because I'm diabetic. But it's always a test every time we eat because, man, I like that rice. <laughs> and I like that ice cream. And I love the cake and, and you know, all kinds of sweets. And that's, that's my problem. In the Garden of Eden, they had to choose between the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And guess what they chose? Right? Choice between two foods. Israel finds itself in Egypt and guess what? Moses comes and God tells Moses all about the first Passover. And what was the first Passover about? Yeah, it's about the angel of death that comes in and the only way to get away from that angel of death is to kill a lamb, take the blood, paint it on the doorstep, well not the doorsteps, but the doorposts, and eat the lamb, right? And the first Passover had, they had lamb, they had bread, or unleavened bread, and they had bitter herbs. It was a feast, everyone was invited, at least the Jews, and everyone else, other nations who were with them, who were also slaves, who wanted to join the Israelites, they were welcome. First Passover, food. And then they got taken out to the wilderness. And guess what? God shows up in the form of a of food again. Mana, quail, and water. Amazing. And then they get into, uh, into Israel, uh, the land of Canaan, and God, and they start to observe three harvest feasts. You know, the uh, spring harvest feast, which is called the Days of Eleven Bread or Passover. Um, the second harvest feast, which is called the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. And then the third harvest festival, which is the Autumn Harvest. And that's the Feast of Tabernacles. And that includes, you know, a whole bunch of other feasts there. Food, again, they get together, they're always food. And if you go to the Middle East, all about food, right? In fact, we had a um, message before that the title was, It's All About Eating. The night that Jesus was betrayed, what did they celebrate? He celebrated the Passover, right? And he said, I've been looking forward to this one because I'm gonna, we're going to do something different. And that night, they had lamb, they had bitter herbs, and they had unleavened bread, and they had wine. And what did Jesus do? He took the cup, or he took the bread, broke it, gave it to them. We don't know exactly whether it was at the beginning, beginning of the, the meal, or in the middle, or at the end. But we know for sure that it was at the end when he took the cup. And, and shared it with them as the blood of the new covenant. Food. After Jesus was crucified and resurrected, two disciples were going down on the road to Emmaus. And they talked with this unknown person. They did not recognize him. But when they got to Emmaus, they said, Hey, I'll come and stay with us. You know, let's, let's have a meal together. And what happens? They recognized Jesus by the way he had, or he opened up the meal, right? Peter, he denied Jesus Christ three times. And how did he get reinstated? Did Jesus went and met them at the Sea of Galilee? Because Peter, wanted, Peter said, uh, let's just go fishing. I'm sick and tired of this. I thought he was the Messiah, but somehow he died, and now we don't know what's going on. 
So they went to the Sea of Galilee, they got on a boat, they fished all night, didn't catch anything. They were professional fishermen. And then Jesus was there on the shore, they didn't recognize him, he talked to them, he said, well put your net out on the other side of the boat. And they did. Now who's this guy telling us what to do all night long, we didn't catch a fish, and we're professional fishermen, but they obeyed him anyway. They didn't know it was Jesus. They pulled a fish, there was an exact count in the scriptures, and then when Peter realized it must be the Lord, because of all the fish that I, we finally caught. And so he jumped into the water, put his clothes on, and then jumped into the water. Which is funny because normally we take off our clothes and jump into the water. But he put on his clothes and jumped into the water. And as soon as he got to the shore, Jesus said, give me some of that fish. Let's roast it. They had, a, they had breakfast and Jesus reinstates Peter, saying, feed my lambs three times. And finally, we're all looking forward. The very last few chapters of Revelation, it talks about food again. Did you ever notice that? It's the marriage feast of the Lamb. And again, we're all invited to that marriage feast. We're all invited. And it's all about food. What, what's, what's this about food? Why is God so somehow so preoccupied with food? He doesn't need to eat, right? Not like us, we need to eat. Now you see sometimes we look at communion, and this is the reason why I'm talking about this. We look at communion and it has become a ritual. We, we think of the churches that have communion every, every Sunday and we think that it has become a ritual. And even if it's once a month, it has to become a ritual. Why? Because we're creatures of habits. We do this one thing that we do every morning, and then the following morning, and then the next morning, and then it becomes a habit. And our habits, when it comes to the church, become traditions, or not even in the church, even in, just in the culture. Our habits become traditions, and our traditions become institutions, and our institutions become monuments. And the next thing you know, God says, it's an old white skin. We need to turn that down. So, but Jesus' focus on communion was not on the tradition or not on the ritual. His focus on the night that he was betrayed was to teach his disciples about loving one another. Amen? Amen. You can't help it. John 13 to verse, uh, chapter 13 to chapter 17, Paul talks about love. That's the main theme of all those chapters. Paul's focus, if you read 1 Corinthians 11, his focus was on taking care of each other. Now let me just briefly say that we, we've talked about this. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, here's the summary. Um, this church, the Corinthian church, they, they had so many things wrong with the way they were doing church, or they were being church. And two of the things that was wrong was that they had factionalism. You know what factionalism was back then in Corinth? They say, one group would say, well, we're followers of Peter, he's, because he's got signs and wonders. You know, he walks and his shadow falls on the people and they get healed. He's got signs and wonders, he can raise the dead. While the other group says, well, Apollos, he's a great Greek orator and teacher and he's got a doctrine. He, he's a good teacher, you know, and, and people want to follow him. And then there's, Peter, and there's Paul. Paul is a great church planter. And he explains things like no other can. If, if the letter to Ephesus, the church in Ephesus. Now that's one of his masterpieces. 
He's great at explaining theology and doctrine. And then the other group says, well, you guys are following men. We're going to follow Jesus. And so four different factions in the church of Corinth. And then they get together on um, maybe once a week for communion. They get together as a church. And then they have communion. And they have a meal. It's not like we have here. It was a real meal. But what happened was the richer folks, they come in early, then they eat the food and drink the wine. They're stuck. They think it's a buffet. And the others think it's a bar. So they're drunk and stuck. And these older, well not older, but the poorer people, the folks who are, you know, close to being uh, bond slaves, they come late in the afternoon and all the food's gone. In Acts chapter 27. Here's the situation. Paul Paul was being taken as a prisoner to Rome. And because he said, well, I appeal to Caesar. So the Jews had a case against him and they were saying bad things about him. So because he was falsely accused, he said, well, I want to go to Caesar and I'll, I'll, I want to appeal my case with him. And so he's on the boat. And on this trip, it was getting close to winter. It wasn't quite winter yet, but it was getting close to winter. Some, sometime maybe early September. They were on the Mediterranean Sea, and Paul says to the captain of the ship, he says, you know what, this is a bad time to, to uh, set sail. You know, you don't know when the storm is going to come. And the storms come right around uh, the start of winter. But, you know, the captain of the ship, he's the captain, he knows better, right? So he says, no, we're, we're, set, we're setting sail. And so they set sail. Around the island of Crete, they, this storm comes in, catches them, and takes them all the way across the Mediterranean towards Malta, which is an island on the west side of the Mediterranean. And along the way, they, the storm was raging, and for so many days they were in the storm, like 14 days or more. And after they had gone a long time, verse 21 of chapter 27, after they had done a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Look, man, you, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have sprayed, uh, spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you, but now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Verse 23, last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. Verse 24, and said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. So here was Paul encouraging the rest of the ship saying, yes, we're in a bad shape, but no, God's going to take care of us. He sent me an angel last night in a dream, and he told me this. So I know we're all going to survive. Now, that's the situation they find themselves in. A few days later, Paul says in verse 33, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You have not eaten anything. Now, how would you like to not eat food for 14 days? <laughs> 14 days? Man, I think some of us would just go for one meal and we'd go like, man, I'm so hungry. Yeah. Herschel, right? <laughs> he likes food. We'd be dead by starvation by the time already. Yeah, 14 days. I mean, we can't go, we can't, we can't go uh, three days without water. For 14 days without food, that's like cutting it close. Mm -hmm. Verse 34. Now I urge you to take some food, 
You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread. Notice this. He takes bread, gave thanks to God in front of them all. I wonder how he would give thanks to God in front of unbelievers. Did you ever thought of that? How would a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, who had been taught by Jesus how to pray, how to give thanks to God for a meal, how would he give thanks for a meal? And he did this in front of unbelievers. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. So they were all encouraged. Jesus is God who's, who gives thanks to God, whom they don't know, breaks the bread, and prepares the meal for them, basically. And he says, mm, come and eat. And they got encouraged, so they came and ate. Here's how Jesus would do it. And here's how Paul would have done it. And here's how Peter would do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 25. Verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Now, mind you, Paul was not one of the original disciples. He didn't even get to see Jesus Christ before. Well, maybe he did, but we don't know that. It's not in the scriptures. But he, didn't, he was not there mentioned at the, at, at the crucifixion. He was not a disciple of Jesus Christ. In fact, after Christ's uh, death and resurrection, he was out killing Christians. So the Lord had to appear to him privately. And the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, this is what he got from the Lord. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He takes the bread. And if you know, you know, if you know the Mediterranean type of bread, you can buy pita bread over at Sam's and in Walmart. It, it's round, you can break it. it it's quite big. And I like to eat the whole thing, but, you know, but if you don't have that much food on the on the boat, you would have to share the food, right? If you had like maybe a basket or maybe two baskets of, of bread, and you had like 300 people in that boat, break it, share it. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus and Paul here reminds us that we need to remind ourselves of what Jesus did on the cross. That's why Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me when you eat this bread. In the same way, after supper, notice, he took the cup after supper. Now, how many... Wine was their staple drink during when, when they eat because wine was more readily available than water. So, when you're having a meal, when do you start drinking? When do you start drinking when you're having a meal? Huh? You drink water after a meal? Or you drink water during the meal? During the meal, right? You do it after? You do it after? No wonder you're dehydrated. <laughs> it's like you say, when you drink something, it's supposed to wash down the food. It's you know? supposed to wash down the food. <laughs> so whatever you do, but maybe maybe you're more biblical, Herschel and, and Janet. <laughs> you take the cup after the, the meal or after supper. Uh, the rest of us are non-biblical. <laughs> we drink our water during the meal. So after supper, he takes the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. It's a reminder. Now, do you want to be reminded once a month or once a year? Uh, or would you rather be reminded every day? 
Every day. Yeah. Yeah. You did it, right? You want to wake up and be reminded of Jesus Christ. Yes. That's why we pray for our meals. Right? Yeah. We pray for our meals. And we don't just pray for our meals. We give thanks to God for our meals. Basically, this is it. And Paul adds here that in verse 26 that it is a proclamation. It's not just a reminder, it's also a proclamation. Verse 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now do I need, do you need me to proclaim Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for you? No, you just need a reminder, right? Yeah. It's all a reminder. When you're at, whenever you're having a meal, you pray for and you give thanks for your meal. It's a reminder for you. I don't need to remind you, but I need to proclaim Jesus Christ to who? The person who doesn't believe Christ. Amen? Amen. We need to proclaim Jesus Christ to those who don't understand, don't know. Now, why on earth would Jesus say and Paul would say that the Lord's Supper is a proclamation of the Lord's death? If it's not for the unbelievers to hear and to see. <coughs> see, the meal is a very important part in the scriptures and in our lives. The meal reminds us that we won't survive without food. We won't survive without water. It's a reminder for all of us that Jesus is the one who saved us, saves us, will save us. It's a reminder to us that without Christ, we are dead. It's a reminder that we need Him every day. Just as much as we need three meals or two meals every day. We need Him even more. So, this Christmas, I want to encourage you to do this. I'm not stopping you from giving gifts, but I'm saying, how about thinking of a different gift? Think about a different gift. And here's the gift. It's the gift of time and presence. The gift of time and presence. Not just your family, but other people. Especially the ones who don't know Jesus Christ yet. We can fellowship over food, and we do that every Sunday. But how about we fellowship over food during the rest of the week? How about we fellowship with other people who don't know who Christ is? Who don't know that the only life there is, is Jesus Christ. How about that? We can fellowship over food. And we can make each meal a reminder and proclamation of Jesus Christ. You can go to Starbucks with someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ, a friend of yours. You just give thanks before you drink that mocha or that latte. You can go to a, what's your favorite restaurant? I know my wife's favorite restaurant. What's your favorite restaurant? Mm. Buffet Asia. Buffet in Asia, that's my wife's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, go there at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and they start serving away. seafood. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, but it's more expensive too. Yeah, well, it's all you can eat. <laughs> For 15 bucks, I appreciate that. Okay, okay. Yeah, you, you can go out with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> she love that. Yeah. So think about your favorite restaurant, right? I hop, what? Carl's Jr. Um, McDonald's. McDonald's. <laughs> forever, forever, okay? They make each meal or snack a reminder and a proclamation of Jesus Christ. It's so simple. You don't have to convince the person to accept Jesus Christ. That's not the deal. You don't have to. They need. But when you have to give thanks to God, even at home, maybe you have members in the family who don't know Jesus Christ yet. Take the, take the opportunity to make each meal a reminder and a proclamation of Jesus Christ. So we're going to do a little sample prayer here and I'd like you to repeat after me, okay? I, I'm, I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can. But it starts off a conversation and maybe it starts off a thought in that person that you're going to dine with, alright? So let's all close our eyes. 
And I'll help you repeat after me this prayer. All right, you guys ready? Father, in Jesus' name, I just want to thank you for this food that we have, for what you gave to us. Thank you especially for Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us, who died on the cross, and because of him, we can look at this meal, mm. bread and whatever else is in that meal. Mm. It's a symbol of him, the life that he gives to us. And even this drink is a symbol of Christ's blood. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For all that you've done for us. Mm. For all that you've done for us. Mm. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. 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 You can make it simpler than that. You know. Just depends on who you're talking to, who the, who the other person is in front of you. You can make it as simple as you want. But the thing is, you drop a seed. Drop a seed. And then next thing you know, during that meal, that's not. Just watch what Jesus does during the meal. Jesus will turn the water into wine. I'm not saying literally, but mm -hmm. I'm talking about your conversation. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? See, God called you to be the church, not just to gather in a room and listen to a sermon. Please remember that. We are the church. So we're going to do a little quiet time here before we have communion. So I'd like to close your eyes uh, in a moment, but here's what we'll pray about. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to give you a face, a face of someone that you know who doesn't know Jesus Christ yet, or a name. It'll come to your mind, it'll be a face that you see in your, in your thoughts, or a name that you see in your, or that you hear in your thoughts. And then I want you to come out of this service with that face or with that name and pray about it. Pray about an opportunity to just share a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or maybe a hamburger. You know, just spend time with that person. Just have a meal. Okay? All right. So, you guys ready? Ready. Okay, close your eyes. Father, I just ask for your Holy Spirit to come. Mm -hmm. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts and into our minds and open up our minds so we can see the person that you want us to touch with your love and with your grace. Allow us to see the face or to remember the name in Jesus.